into it. Good evening and welcome back to a brand new episode of Around the Pit. Guys, it's a new show. We are at episode three, two and a half, depending on how you really look at it. Excited to be back with you this week. My name's Toffees. As always, you can find me at Toffees underscore Dota 2. And I'm joined here uh, by some really great guests who are brought to you in part by the folks over at Razer, makers of some of the finest equipment in esports. All right, let's do some quick introductions for the gentlemen joining me here today. Now, I'm sure that you probably don't need to be introduced to them, but I'm going to introduce them anyway, and then I'll explain the rules for our game. First up, on my left and your right, if I got my mirrors correct, you're going to see Mr. David Gorman, known as LD, the returning champion from week one, who got into a bit of a rough and tumble showdown with our second guest, both who were invited back to determine who the actual winner is going forward. How are you doing tonight, David? I'm, I'm good. Uh, I'm not sure I'm as great a guest as Mr. Grant Grant in chat, though. So, you know, got, a, got a little work cut out. You, know. <laughs> you got you to gotta live up to the rage that is Grant. Uh, and it adds some quality rage. I look forward to uh, the day that he comes on the show and we all get to listen to that one. Uh, the scoring system will be beautiful. Second guest, by the way, if we talk about North American Dota, is somebody who you're all very familiar with after his appearance at TI, as well as the team's emergence in the Dota scene over the last year. This is the captain of Complexity, a man who used to go by the name Swindle Melons, who's now just Swindles. And this is Kyle Friedman. How are you doing tonight? You're muted, Kyle. Walls. Wah, just, wah, just windows, wah. Dock him a point. Yeah, uh, no, we're taking away. Kyle. We're taking away that point that we gave you for the. It's uh... Fine, give LD a head start. He needs a <laughs> Hi. All right, I like that. That was quality right there. Our this last. What do you expect from players when they do anything that's on the internet or <laughs> when they do anything to cameras at all? Just, just, yeah, just, just why, why, do you, why don't you stick to scheduling scrims, Kirk? <laughs> Oh, wow. when you get your players oh. to show up on time. You can lecture me. On oh, that. oh, stick to scheduling, to uh, scheduling scrims because, man, really when you schedule game. a tournament, nobody ever plays. That said, our third <laughs> guest is going to be Greg Laird. You know him as What Is Hip TV, the uh, old man. I don't know if you're still the manager of Archon or what's going on with that, but the manager uh. of Archon from Once Upon a Time, <laughs> uh, a man who runs HGTV and was the uh, brains behind Dota Pit Season 3. Doing, there are Greg? so many incorrect statements in that introduction. I know, right? <laughs> where, where do we begin? <laughs> we had a new topic of roasting Greg. Uh, <laughs> no. No. So no. it's what is shit TV? <laughs> High ground TV is dead. And I don't know what Greg does with his life, but uh, I think he's managing, listing any activities. I'm managing the uh, managing the High Council the of Wizards and High Council. Yeah, that's no. the name of the team, Greg. Try and keep track. No. Who's on your roster again? I know the roster. I hate their name though. I refuse to acknowledge that it exists. <laughs> They're HCWP in my book. Okay. So Gerg will stick to refusing to acknowledge the existence of a team. That will bring us to the rule set for the game. If you're new to the show, guys, it's very simple. Uh, because of the Roche theme, every topic gets 8 to 11 minutes. After 8 minutes, you'll hear the first buzzer, and that lets me know that we can buzz the guys anytime that we feel like a closing statement has come out. So long story short, when you hear this... <laughs> It means it's time to stop talking. It's time to move on to the next topic. That is unless one of the players decides that they really feel like their voice wasn't heard or they have something serious to talk about. And at any point during the show, they are allowed to demand a soapbox. And that is a 45-second period of complete control of the microphones. I will mute the other speakers, and they will be able to say just about anything that they want. So, gentlemen, feel free to use your soapbox at any time during the show. That is 100% your choice, your responsibility. So I look forward to seeing if you uh, use it or not i think we've only had it used once and it's been a lot of fun uh the time that it was used so those are the rules they're pretty simple the other thing you might notice is there is a scoreboard above each player and i do assign points for uh well i assign a point if it's a good point i assign a point if it makes me laugh i take points away if it's drivel uh it's just a lot of fun and whoever has the most points in the game wins the ages which means they are allowed to cash it in to come back for the next show or we'll actually change it up and say any show that fits their schedule in the near future, because I understand that things are getting a little bit crazy out there in uh, Dota 2 tournament land. That said, let's get right into this thing, because I have talked long enough, and let's be honest, you're not here for me, you're here for these gentlemen. The first topic up today is the one that was decided on by the straw poll, and that is the new elimination tournament that we saw run by Terra Cow Studios. Uh, just wrapped up today. I believe the big winner was uh, 4C, 4C and L as they beat Digital Chaos in the grand final. 
gentlemen, here's my question. The format was interesting. What did you think of it? I want to know, is this the beginning of, see, the rise of niche tournaments? Or is this just sort of the staple for this studio? Right, because these are the same guys who arguably brought us Captain's Draft tournaments. Um, are we going to see them do anything besides just sort of niche stuff? Or are they going to stick to this uh, this pocket? And does it work? Um, and I will also will have, I have one more question to add to it later, but I don't want to bring that up just yet. So... Let's start now. Format, did you like it? And do you think this is a staple for tournaments going forward or just something we see arbitrarily once in a while? Let's start out with, uh, let's start with LD tonight. All right, so I thought it was awesome format. Uh, to me, it works only towards the end of a patch though, because when there's a new patch, the top teams are not gonna wanna show strategies too much mm -hmm. and they're gonna be much more focused on like actually playing captain's mode. So they wanna prepare for tournaments. I'll, the biggest part of competitive Dota outside of actual execution is the draft. You can't practice the draft in this mode. So okay. I think it's perfect for now, but uh, to me, it's a tournament that's most interesting also when the patch is stale and the patch is mega fucking stale right now. Like, <laughs> you can't, I can't go a cast without at some point during like a seven hour broadcast, just turning to gods or winter me like, hey, are you excited for 6.85? So, right. so I think in that sense, great tournament. Their Sir Action Slacks is fucking dank as all hell. I love that guy, he's amazing. Um, they're a new studio. They're definitely trying to stand out. They will have to do something different to do that. Uh, and it's also tough to fit anything big into the scene right now because mm. there's ESL, there's MLG. Uh, we just started to announce the Summit 4. There's other tournaments, Nanyang Championships. I think there's one or two more that maybe haven't been fully announced yet, or at least qualifiers for right. upcoming events at the beginning of next year. So it's kind of tough to fit a big event in, and they're also a new studio. So, mm -hmm. hey, starting out as a new studio, come up with a great format, very entertaining, end of the patch. They're filling that need for people that just want something different. So... Uh, I, given the circumstances, I think awesome event, and uh, I, I don't know that it's going to be their main type of content. We'll mm. see, but uh, definitely something different. So I, I enjoyed it a lot. Based on viewer numbers, big splash. Uh, what do you think, Gerg? Yeah, well, well, <laughs> not saying that Pit Lord's been released is a good way to boost your yeah, viewer that's count, a good right? way to boost your viewer numbers. <laughs> I mean, I think the format's fine. I actually, uh, when I was working at Vulcan, I actually toyed around with a format very similar to this, for but for a league tournament, uh, because in league it's like. You know, the lanes are a lot more fixed. Uh, the, all the heroes are, like, way more set in their roles. It's way more boring in terms of, like, heroes in the meta compared to Dota, which, I mean, you, we complain about Dota now, but even now compared to League, there's a lot more uh, variety. So uh, I think it's a really cool format. Meme Duck TV is just, I mean, if you're looking for chief meme worms, I think they've taken over from Good Studio. Mm. Uh, well, I think Sir Action Slacks has taken well, over. <laughs> That's, that's, a, that's a one-man show. Let's be real here. Uh, overall, I think it's fine. I actually really like these shorter tournaments. Mm. Um, I had toyed around a lot in the past with like doing some sort of like, you know, like small weekend tournaments. This was a little bit longer than that. Um, but I think like small weekend tournaments with a lot of production value have uh, definitely have a place in the scene because for me, these really long tournaments get really like after a while they just get boring. Mm. Like. I don't, Here's even if it's like a new season or like new teams, I, I just find myself like not giving a shit at all because it's just like, especially, you know, th something like Star Ladder is like super victim of this for me at least is like, I, I don't right. give a fuck. So, so I'm, I'm, I like new things. Just take it. Just take it, Swindle. Just take it. I, so I wanted him to give it to me. I didn't want to just take it from Go ahead. Please, nice somebody study cut there. that out for an audio file. Please I take. just, I just, um, the thing about Dota is that even... On a month by month for sure, but even on a week by week basis, the team's strength level will change because the way that you're drafting will alter. Hmm. So um, you, you can scrim like NA teams, there's really only like four or five that are on like an equal playing field. Mm -hmm. And the teams that win, like even just from personal experience, will beat one team like five times in a row, then they'll beat us three times. And it's because they sort of figure out our new tweak right. and then we have to tweak it back. So it's whenever a tournament goes on for like a month and a half, two months, you don't actually know who the best team is because it, you could, you know, one team, they lose a big qualifier and then all of a sudden they're playing this match in a tournament that doesn't really matter as much and they're tilted. They're not as focused. Like I, I like tournaments that are quick. So that's why I prefer. I like this tournament. I, see what I don't you're think saying. it'll ever become the main just because as LD said, patch is so fucking stale right now mm -hmm. that, even like drafting, everyone's like we're still able to copy shit that was run at TI like a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. and it's still good. <laughs> yeah, still and really like, good. <laughs> the patterns are the same, and it's just it's so boring that the tournament was nice. I will say, as a drafter, I was like I was just clueless because I mm -hmm. it's so weird. Captain's draft is one thing, but when you're like 
oh, okay, well, they're doing this. You don't realize like what becomes broken because you know 40 heroes are gone and all right. of a sudden, wow, I lost the draft. I don't know what to do, guys. There's no heroes left. Right. But it was entertaining to say the least. I got it. Like Suns fan, he's really just a visionary, like a, a real pathfinder in the scene. And I'm just really looking forward to not so much Moonduck TV, but, but what does Suns fan off. have in store for us next? That's what I'm really waiting for. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even know, I don't even know how to assign points for that. <laughs> that was impressive. Just give him like an extra ten points. Extra ten. I'm gonna give him one because I'm I feel like I feel like there was a lot of butt licking thinking. going on at the same time. All right. So let me continue on this as we talk about this thing. Um, the student they did something very interesting. They had, and I don't think I've seen this before. Correct me if I'm wrong. Panels between each match, the same kind of like the idea of what you would see to land, right? The coming to the desk, a host, an analyst, and then a Sir Action Slacks. This is something we haven't seen in online tournaments. It was very casual. It was in their bedrooms, in t-shirts. Um, is this something that you think is going to become the norm? Or is this just sort of a, hey, we're a new studio. We're trying something new. Um, do you think it spoke to the fans and it's going to be a demand? And if it is, is that cost effective? Uh, well, obviously, it's cheaper, right, if they don't have a studio. That's so true. it's more cost effective than the alternative, mm -hmm. unless you're just not doing a panel at all. Um, I will say, running from a tournament organizer perspective and just from a broadcaster perspective, paying like 11, 10, I don't know exactly how many people they have, like 10 or 11 people for mm -hmm. four days when you've got like seven matches, not hugely sustainable for the event. Of course, a lot of these guys have, you know, other sources of income, whether they're personal streamers, Suns Fantasy Cinema. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them work big events where, you know, they can afford to maybe lose little money as individuals. Uh, but in the long run, especially for the people who don't have other sources of income, not sure how sustainable the business mm -hmm. model is. We'll, we'll see. Um, but I, I think for them, it was much more about making a big slash. And they definitely yeah, did. It is. Um, I think in addition, like, to sort of follow up on, like, actually being sustainable, I think when you put that much, like that many resources into such a small period of time, mm -hmm. it's kind of like you kind of have to rely on like outside sponsor money. There's, it's, it seems pretty hard to make a tournament like that cost effective, or, or at least create enough revenue to make it worth it. I mean, even beyond the prize pool, like the the biggest problem in my mind with these small events is uh, like you can't get as much ticket money. Yeah, gotcha. to me, it's a loss leader. It's like the event that you run, you're announcing yeah, your new you video, it, you, you, you try to like make a splash. Exactly. And they obviously you made a trick out of it. You put a bunch of extra videos up, you try to make everyone notice. And then in the back, and then, you know, you, once you but move forward, you it, can kind of back off that a little bit. Does it, I mean, forgive me if I'm naive here, because I obviously don't work in a studio, but isn't all that really matters how many tickets you sell if you're looking at just making well, a profit? Well, so first of all, they didn't have a ticket. So mm -hmm. obviously, they're not I mean, getting revenue. In terms of money? Um, yeah. Online tour, like Sponsors purely. Sponsors are a lot too. So Dota TV revenue is, if you don't have hats, like it's basically it's nothing. nothing. Like even mm -hmm. if you have ESL one, like you look at, you look at how much they added to the prize pool, like what it was just the ticket. And I think it was like, what was it, Greg? Like $3,000 or something. And this is like arguably the biggest Western event, right? And they had released their chest. It wasn't the most beloved chest. It adds like 20000 Well, it also came mm -hmm. out like the day the tournament started, didn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think it crowdfunded until like the end of the month or something to add to the prize board. Something like that, I, I seem to recall. But yeah, I mean, like from a business model point of view, so the, the state of streaming right now is ad revenue is going way down hmm. in general because more people are using ad block. Uh, yes. that's, the, that's the biggest issue. Way more. So like, you can't rely on Twitch like ad revenue. A little more, like a lot more. So you can't rely on Twitch ad revenue. Ticket sales are just not a reliable source of revenue. So you're mainly looking at hats. Uh, as well as sponsors and sponsors mm. in general are going to be the biggest chunk of that yeah, so. sponsors are always like the lion's share of stuff like this yeah. okay now for valve it's different like obviously valve's the exception but first of all valve releases items that are just like they set the whole ecosystem up so the items that they release are like the awesome shit you know the arcanas mm. the immortals like they're never like those those that level of items will never be given to a third party event and if it is it's only because Valve has come up with something new and even better that's going to be the new arcade. Um, <laughs> to, to touch on the topic, I forgot what it was for a second, but regarding like a panel system, I, I think like it's just way too many people. I think you three people to me is the max that should be talking about a game right after it's finished because you get this sort of bystander effect that develops and you have five people all bullshitting and none of them really paid close attention to the game. One guy, probably Cinder or Draskal, knows what the fuck he's talking about and everybody else is just kind of like memes woohoo well, and then you move on to the next game i i just I rather actually, i, I did not like the exact composition of their panel i'd mm. agree with swindle 
Uh, well, I mean, it's you're limited by the talent you have. That's right the now. time that we've got for that topic. But I will to, uh, to agree. I think that you guys made some very good points there. Uh, right. Also, I do want to point out that you know, Swindle, you were right. There were a couple where I saw. I think Motpax joined the panel today. That there were like three in between breaks where he just sort of sat there and never really got a chance to say anything because of the way that the online panel works. Well, so that's on the host, right? And to comment, Motpax, Motpax knows his shit. He does. He does. Packs, he does. A bomb. Yeah. Made us. He is a stat lord. He's really a straight is. up. He is a boss. So uh, great, very interesting. Thing. HGTV. So let's. Uh, nice. Nice. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go into it. It's not a flame gird game. Let's go on to the next topic. All right. Mm, uh, this next one is hit. the second one that was voted for by the crowd as we got started with the show today. And that is the issue of doping, scripting, cheating in general. Uh, the two that pop up the most often are doping and scripting. What I want to ask you is, are these real issues or are they red herrings? Are they things that we just talk about because everybody else talks about them in other sports? Um, and, and feel free to break them apart. If you think doping is and scripting isn't or vice versa, uh, feel free to let us know. But we'll start off with Swindles on this one. Thank you. Um, scripting is a huge problem. There are ways to edit the just specific console commands that can give you an unfair advantage over other players. Um, auto execs are one thing, but mm. there are techies mind scripts. There are hus there are armlet toggle scripts. There are insta hex scripts. Like you can't allow them because they are just not fair. And it is, it, it's just not cool. I think there, there's I a reason why valve made all the players handwrite their configs and then yeah. type them in manually of TI. Yeah. And that's, I don't think will ever be an issue. Um, I feel like Valve events are really the prestige, and that's what actually matters until players try to win. So no one's going to cheat at ESL, I don't think, and then go to TI and not cheat. It just wouldn't make sense. It's like the same reason people don't stream cheat. It just doesn't make sense because you can't stream cheat when it actually matters. So what's the point? You're not making yourself better. As for doping, I think if there were any truly performance-enhancing drugs, that would be the case. But... Um, uh, from from the stories my friends have told me, um, pot and alcohol and anything you can find in your mom's medicine cabinet are probably not going to make you a better Dota player. Your mom sounds okay, like those, a badass. Most you. definitely will not. Why are those things? You, you just that was, you just straw man the fuck presents? out of the performance enhancing drug argument. Okay, okay. I, no, nobody's pot, Jesus, pot is one of those so pot is one of those interesting ones where some players like and I've heard pros say like they play better when they're high. Like mm -hmm. there are some pros who think they play better when they're high. I'm not sure if it's true. That's what they think. Probably they do because it's in their head. Alcohol, definitely not more than like one or two drinks. <laughs> Garbage. 100% worse. If you think you're playing better, you're full of shit. Um, I would say, I think, I think Adderall does make you play better, but the problem is Dota tournaments mm -hmm. are very fucking long, right? Like your average, average tournament outside of TI, like teams have to sit around for like six, eight hours. That shit wears off, dude. And mm -hmm. then you got to come down, and you're going to play worse than you would otherwise. So I don't think it's really mm -hmm. sustainable. But yep. in a short burst, it definitely makes you play better. I, I don't know. I think it depends on your role. I had a... For like, a, for like mechanics intense players. So like mm -hmm. mid players especially, probably the ones that come to mind, really micro intensive heroes. I definitely think it, it helps. I the thing is Dota is so much more of it's not like StarCraft or Counter-Strike it's a, a lot more spatial awareness is necessary in addition to communication mm -hmm. and just comprehend like you can't uh, it, it, Adderall gives you very increased tunnel vision and you have much more focus on the task at hand, but I feel like you're way, way, way worse at just multitasking and what actually makes you a Dota player and, you know, thinking about what's happening top lane as you push bottom as an example just becomes more difficult. Um, I'm not sure you would want the whole team on Adderall, but like if your mid players on Adderall, like let's say it's legal, it's fine, everyone can use it. You can put, you can maybe put one player on Adderall and then the other, the rest of the team still more multitasking. Focus I, mean, on the mini -map. I also don't think that it's it's not that hard to watch the minimap while also you know focusing on your mid lane like that's well, something pro players do anyway. Here's the follow up question: Is it a bad thing if it was people started doing Adderall? I mean, people make the argument in baseball that steroids made the game more enjoyable because the players oh. became better. I mean, what Shut do you up. think? Take away, like, that, yeah, no, that, no, that, no. Hold on, I'm just, logic, I'm just taking just points have... away. By because... that logic, we should have robots just play. <laughs> like, let's say there's a robot that can play Dota better, right? We should just have 5v5 robots, right? Swindle so, so lost the point for, for trying to advocate that something that's illegal should just be okay. But, so I can see... What? You can't just go out and buy Adderall. Who made, like, let's assume who made, it's What do you mean? Let's just assume it's legal. It doesn't we, matter. Whoa. What do you mean illegal? If you, if you, walk, I, you can't walk into a, into a, you can't walk into a pharmacy and say, I'd like some Adderall for my video games, I, please. 
Yes, you can. You can oh, go to a doctor oh, and say, okay. excuse me, I've been having yeah, trouble. But let's say you have a prescription. It's very easy. All right, why, why is the moderator debating now? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I just, like, I just got fired up. You can't say it's illegal. It's a prescription narcotic that That's... you get as easily as medical marijuana in California. All you have to do is say, I have trouble focusing, doc. Please help me out. Okay, here you go. Like, <laughs> I, I think it's very tangential anyway to me, to me yeah. though, because like – yeah, maybe steroids make players better in the mm. sense that, like, you know, they can hit more home runs and their batting average goes up, whatever the effect is. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean the game's more enjoyable. And the fact that people, because it's in people's minds, it automatically detracts from the viewing experience. Mm. You know that some players are using it, some players aren't, or at least you're thinking about it. That's the biggest issue is pretty much nobody's using this in Dota. I'm sure there are, like, a couple pros out there, maybe not as well known, who use it doesn't necessarily make them better. Mm. And fans are, fans are spending way more time worrying about this than it's actually an issue. In Counter-Strike, it's a much Counter -Strike, bigger Counter-Strike, it's a, it's a real issue. Because literally, in Counter-Strike, like, once you have your mechanics down, like, it's how quickly do you react to seeing a guy yeah, on your screen. Like, that's the biggest thing. So. Yeah. Just, just to, I want to just clarify on the one point about it being illegal. It's a prescription drug in nearly every country. Valve events have no testing whatsoever for it. They, their security is that they don't let you take your gear or rather they, they have possession of your gear dur during the entire event and they will wand you before you enter the stage. But there is no drug testing. You can do whatever the hell you want to yourself before going out on stage. And it is legal that you can get a prescription for it. So it's, it's, I think it's definitely a real concern. But the question is, what can you actually do about it? Because it stays in your system for a very short period of time. And I mean, you can just do what ESL like, did and that, just yeah, drug test people the day the in the lab. But what, if have, but what if I have a prescription for it? What are you going to do now? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't think it? that's the right thing to do. I'm just saying that that's what ESL did at the last Counter Strike event. Yeah, fair. I mean, okay, but but see, that's where that's where like we could spend the entire episode debating about ESL's drug policy because mm. they specifically say you're not allowed to have not, you're not allowed to use marijuana or alcohol or any other substances during the event. Like you can if you if you fail the drug test, but it's like before the event, they don't care. Mm -hmm. What what the fuck business of ESLs is it if you happen to get high at the end of the night? Like you show that shit wears off the next morning. You show up, you're ready to play. Like that's not their fucking business. I, I like, mean, I agree. I think I was just saying. I mean, I think ESL kind of overstepped their boundaries when they did this, and a lot of it was just a way for them to save face because of one interview, and they were the next big LAN, and the community was all fucking enraged about it. And I mean, in my opinion, it was a total PR stud. The whole yeah, video. it definitely was, dude. They're, they were. I like, see every every time there's like a big mainstream media article. Fuck G, whatever the fuck it is, and it was in every. It was, it was like a like Wall Street Journal was, article, and Kenny gets just retweeting every single yeah. article about this. <laughs> no, I completely yeah. agree. I like think they're so proud of the fact that they're getting mainstream coverage off of it. But I definitely agree with you. It's, it's called it's, cover your ass security. The TSA does it all the time. You have to take your shoes off in the airport in America because this guy named Richard Reed failed to blow up a plane with a bomb in his shoes. So now the rest of us have to suffer for the rest of our lives. Okay, that's that fine. But, but the illusions are so dog shit. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay, but, Dude, but let's even let's suppose that, no, right. no, no. How did you just compare drug testing to terrorism? <laughs> okay, that's because beside the point, though. That's, that's real. Really you point. you drug issue. test, but it's still, it's not like it actually is going to stop people at other events or even at that event. It's just so the public shuts the fuck up and Reddit leaves them alone. The, kid, no, the guys are still no. going to do Adderall. They were way too excited to share that, to retweet. The, oh, they look, the Wall Street Journal is talking about ESL. Retweet. Like, they're trying way too much attention <laughs> to that shit. That was a total PR stunt. If they were actually just worried about the public perception esports, they would have just made their normal announcements. Like, they went out of their way to interview with mainstream media, make a big fucking deal about the fact that ESL is saving esports from the performance-enhancing drug plague. Like, fuck off, ESL. Are you serious? <laughs> what a joke. All right, I'm done with this topic. Let's move on. <laughs> Fuck it. It's over. Scripting is not a problem at competitive le level. Move on. So it's, cool. it, do you think, it, I, I, honestly though, so you talked about this and I don't want to leave this because I want to talk about scripting. We talk about doping a lot. Scripting is so, No, but here's okay, my question though. You, no, no, you brought up the fact that Valve made you, ma made players manually type in their console commands or, or whatever it was at the event. That said, and I don't understand scripting, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a tech person. Uh, what's preventing people from using those in qualifiers and home games that are really determining big events? I mean, these are big okay. deals. Hold on, hold on. I think, okay. well, hold on, hold on, hold on. We have to have a clarification point here. Putting things in the console is not what scripting is. There are things you can put in the console that are like right. no, I understand that. shaky in terms of like, should you be able to do it? But Valve removed most of those. Scripting has nothing to do with console. Scripting is running outside programs to like fuck with the way that you play in game. It's okay. a third party program. The thing about scripting is it's really fucking obvious when you're scripting on a lot of the heroes. Some of them it's not. Like, 
I guess armlet toggle, you could argue, it's like, oh, then maybe that person's actually that good. But like the one, the techies ones, the hex ones, the Yules ones, it, their fucking cursor is not on the hero when the ability gets used on it. So it's blatantly obvious. All right, so to clarify, because apparently I, I was off base there, they made players handwrite their configs. They didn't have to type anything into the console command or something like that. I don't, I'm, I'll be honest, I don't understand scripts to save my life. But, so you said it's very different. It's a third-party program. Scripting, my question well, scripting is- scripting and the console have nothing to do with each other. That's fair. Yeah. Okay, the so as a third-party program, do you think that it's being used in qualifiers and large-scale tournaments or to earn spots at large-scale lands? Because is, is that a real okay, issue or well, is that not? No, okay, it's, not a, it's not a real issue because all the- They're gonna get caught. Okay. Well, all, all the, no, here's the biggest. This is why land and tor land tournaments are really important, and where, like, I'm not a really a big fan of like large six digit purely online events because all the prize money is gated behind the land event for most tournaments. Like, yeah, you know, like say at the summit, like you qualify, you get like the last place prize money, mm -hmm. but it's really not that much compared mm -hmm. to like the vast majority of the prize money is for actually performing at the land. So this is where land tournaments mm -hmm. are. And I, ideally, the solution to it, I mean, because the, there's other types of cheating to be worried about before you start worrying about certain, like, like extreme scripting. Like, nobody's going to get away with, like, actually running a techie script. Even in a big, high-profile match, like, they're going to fucking get caught if they're really yeah. abusing. So I, I think it's a non-issue, to be honest. I, I, to piggyback off that, I feel like most players see T, well, Valve-sponsored events as, like, what you play Dota for. Um, obviously, you know, being able to support yourself, making a career of gaming is a big deal, but you know, there's a, the, for fuck's sake, TI5 was like $17.5 million. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what people dream about. That's why people play Dota. And they're, you're, you're not gonna get away with cheating there. And I don't think that any serious player who's a threat to, you know, the Kings is going to be cheating in the qualifiers just to get there. It, the difference um, in Counter Strike is like it's way harder to actually tell when someone's cheating. Tell, yeah. It's like super a totally awesome. different ball game. So I don't even yeah. think it's a, an app. Trigger, trigger bots are like pretty are pretty blatant, but like if yeah. you're like aim locking or something, it's pretty hard to catch. Yeah, them. Fnatic cheats every land. All right, so then we will wrap that up there. You guys have uh, taught me a lot about scripting, and I will try to learn more. Not really. Um, because I don't think it's that big of an issue. I think you guys are right. So I'll look up some things. Let's be honest. All right, moving on to the next topic. This one, uh, starting us over. Let's see. Let's talk about this. And this probably won't take the full eight minutes, but I want to get your opinions as folks who are probably in the scene and probably have information. Majors is, I think, less than two months away, and there's still no official word from Valve or really any sort of information for the common man. Is False. this is this a problem or is this okay? Are you guys hearing things or is everybody in the dark? Can, can I take this first if you don't I mind? Don't no shit, dude. Sure. Um, first, I thought coming from Han, okay, and Han, I've only been playing Dota for like a year and a month or two now, and I played Han for like four years, and I I always saw Valve as like this this wonderful company that was like super mysterious, and they would just casually <laughs> throw tournaments out, and they'd be like a million something dollars. But now that I've been in the scene, I realize you know it's not really as cute when you're playing the game so like we really don't know shit a lot of the time hmm. like we we have like a tentative date we know it'll be in the fall that that's what we've got we have no real clue and i just there's the like hundreds of people planning their lives around these events not including just players but even just viewers and casters and production studios and none of us have any idea like we don't even know what the when the patch comes out reborn is still buggy and there's no word at all like we don't even know what's going on and it just it's mind boggling to me because they're making so much money and you would think there'd at least be a hey guys we know the client's pretty bad right now we're working on it New, more info soon like all we need is a coming soon that was what han's like big thing was was just coming soon tm but mm. we wouldn't even get that we just have I silence think everyone knows it's coming soon like right. come yeah. on that's, that's, that's that really make you feel better in, i don't buy that at all in, in han you weren't <laughs> sure if it was real or not in valve you they said there's majors there's going to be a major right. eventually so you can plan on it you just don't know when it will happen so i guess i guess that's better i'm not complaining they put a lot of money in but i just we just don't know, honestly. Fair. Do you know LD? I mean, Val, I, I, I know maybe a little bit more, but it's not like, honestly, they're still figuring shit out is generally my impression of what's going on. And they're probably like, if you get to like 
deep. I don't know. Like I, the way I envision it at a Valve working, I mean, I'm maybe I'm totally off base. Is everyone's busy with their own shit, right? They've got this very flat structure, and so the people that are most involved with the majors, they probably have a the vast majority of the details already sorted out, mm -hmm. and they're putting the finishing touches on a lot of stuff. And then once you have all the details sorted, you've got to get all the announcement graphics out. You have to coordinate with whoever the partner is for the event. You need to get the monetization set up, so they have to figure out what's the new shit we're going to add to make money to help sell compendiums. I'm sure they're very far along, and they have all the shit mostly figured out. And some of the details may not actually be the right way to do it, but that they're going to have to learn that by fucking it up with the event. Like so, ultimately, that's going to be the way that it improves. It's not the fall major won't get better because Reddit hears Valve's plans, or you guys hear Valve's plans and say, "No, that's terrible." That may fix some things, but the biggest way they're going to improve is they run the event, they see what worked, they see what didn't, they get better. It's the same thing we had with the summit, obviously on a much bigger scale. I mean, I mean they they have shared some details though. Like they've they've shared they're going to be qualifiers. They will Qualifier be inviting like team to regional qualifiers. They they'll be doing direct invites. Like that much is confirmed. Beyond that. They did, I just they don't did. really get why they haven't said the date of that. The thank you. They they do have well oh, oh, for, oh for the actual major the actual event three like, fucking points off of that one. When does it end do and we, where is it? Do we like, know yeah, where yeah, it is? What what continent will it be on? Well, they've already it. said that. Well, Eric Johnson. Said that well, okay, so so if you do your digging, Eric Johnson in a random interview with a random website. Uh, or news outlet said that it will be in Europe in the fall. Like, so he did say that. But to me, that this does go to your point is like, why the fuck is like a random interview an acceptable source of information? Why yeah. why is this not like at least officially announced by Valve a little bit? So yeah, I mean, I have no problem with like you know we like all that other stuff. You know, coverage details, partners like that does not even release to the public. Yeah. But like place, date, mm -hmm. and like rough format would be just <laughs> awesome. But it just it goes back to just the way like Valve I mean, does things. The Ice Frog announced that the patch was coming in a week on the like dev forum randomly. Well, that's like the appropriate place to do that. I, I <laughs> suppose, but Dota Two has a blog. I I don't know. I I just like it, it's interesting because that's how Valve has always done things. Well, yeah, it's, it's just a result of the way that their company is structured. Like, yeah. So, but there's, I know, there's really there's no hire really anyone there that's like an esports community manager that would do all of this stuff in all the other games. And that's just how it is, and that's how it's always going to be. Pretty much, I mean, maybe it's not how it's always going to be, but that's how it is for it's the most part. Not hurting part. their bottom line, right? They're still selling yeah, hats. It's like, so they're still selling hats. I mean, the, I game, the game's growth has slowed, but I don't really think that's because I don't think Valve necessarily looks at that and is like, oh, it's because we're not communicating more with the community. It's just because, you know, they've kind of saturated. Like they've gotten all the people who didn't have a MOBA and wanted mm. to play a MOBA, and now if they want to make ground, it's just a matter of esports slowly getting bigger. I think, uh, and gaming in general slowly building an audience. But we can. Uh, it sounds like everybody is sort of agreeing that while the details maybe aren't something that we should have, we should at least have a save the date card, right? Like I will. I will say Valve has done a very good job of communicating with organizers about the dates so that there aren't conflicts with events. They also are working around the DreamHack dates as well. Uh, I will say that DreamHack's at the very end of November, so they. It's not like they aren't working with people, but it's more they don't want to. I think they just don't want to announce exact dates and then end up in a situation where. You know, like the exact date slightly change, and then someone throws a shit bit. So they're, but they are, they are at least working with the people who need to know the dates most importantly first, which is other people trying to organize events. Because mm -hmm. yeah, players need to know the dates, but vast majority of pros are, vast majority of people likely to qualify for TI, if not every single person is basically doing it full time, and or will make the time to play TI whenever or sure. a major whenever it's available. So mm -hmm. I, 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 as much as it's frustrating, and I don't agree with the way Valve's doing it. I will say they are thinking about it. They do care about it, and they're definitely improving compared to like a year and a half ago. We didn't even know that the TI qualifiers were happening or when the dates were until like hmm. three weeks before the qualifiers. Hmm. They're like, oh yeah, make a, run a hub. <laughs> you guys are right. gonna do the hub for, uh, or there's gonna be two hubs. I mean, so they have gotten a lot better in that. Space. Yeah, and to comment on that, I I. I talked with a bunch of Valve guys at TI. I pretty much did nothing but bullshit for a few days. And a lot of them, like the guy who, you know, the people who edit the videos, like the p person filming the actual content and updating the social media, that's not like his job. He's a artist. Yeah, they're all, all of them. Everyone effects. that does TI is like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That's they're, why they're I was just, saying there's no, there's no yeah. esports community manager yeah, about no they, they literally have their desks on wheels and they'll just kind of 
move well, around. They're, they're just not. They're not that's overstated. <laughs> they're, they're not. They're not in the, <laughs> every day. You just move to a new. <laughs> um, they, I'm gonna they, work they, in the they, hallway they, today, they guys. So many hats. You go wear. in the bathroom. There's a guy there, just like probably <laughs> jerking off all day. <laughs> that bathroom's off limits, all of a sudden. I'm just saying that they're they're doing a bunch of things at once. So there's no, like you said, there's no like. There's no boss and then four under bosses and then 10 middle managers. It's, it's really just like, from what I understood, there's Eric Johnson and then everybody just works on Dota and hmm. hopefully it turns out good. And they really do give a shit about the players and putting on a good show. And I think one thing um, Gabe said during the kickoff during, for TI was they, they just love Dota. Like they watch Dota. The actual executives will watch Dota and enjoy it. And that's probably why, you know, five years into this, we know nothing about the majors, but everybody's still sort of continuing their blind faith that Valve knows what's best. Well, the other thing is that work out. Is organizing the event, like they do a pretty impeccable job with like, sure. you know, accommodations and flights. Yeah. And, yeah. So I think like, I said TI it. TI is so easy. Mm -hmm. like, I think I said it last no week or maybe, well, I guess two weeks ago that, you know, I, I think the fall major will probably have quite a few issues. I, I expect it to not be that smooth of an event. Uh, it's certainly like, TI, like I'd say, like at best, it's like TI4 versus TI5. But to me, the main thing is Valve has a history of getting better, always getting better. They always iterate. So TI2 was a pretty good event at Benaroya overall, like mostly because there were some really epic moments in gameplay. TI3 was just blew it out of the water. TI4, as much as people bitch about it, the actual event and the production, the fact that Dota's moved into a big stadium, that was still overall a step up for the game. The prize pool still grew even more. Player treatment did improve from TI3 to TI4. They got better, and TI5, obviously. They, TI5, TI5 to me was, was probably the most great. dramatic improvement Valve's had yet overall. Yeah, TI5 was really, really great. Like, yeah. that that right. blew me away, man. That's all the time we have for that topic, but I do agree it was my first TI, and I my mind was blown, so I can only imagine. Uh, moving on to the next topic up on the list. This is one that uh, Swindle actually brought up earlier that he was curious about, and I'm curious to get everybody's opinion on it. And that is this announcement of the patch that just came out. So as we brought up a little bit earlier in the show on the dev forums, we learned that there's going to be a patch next week. This is going to be balance based, um, and they're going to wait till after the major or the major, I believe, for the next one. So this patch, if I understand it, is coming out sort of after all the qualifiers, right before a LAN, and perceivably, if the next major's in less than two months, right before the qualifiers for the next major. Is that enough time to learn? Is this the right time frame to do the change in the patch? Is this going to be a big enough change, do you think, to even warrant us worrying about it? Uh, we started with everybody else. Let's start with Greg on this one. Uh, personally, I wish, <coughs> excuse me, I wish the patch was like maybe a few weeks ago, but I think it's, I don't know, it's fine. I mean, I would, my, my very short response is any patch that doesn't just like fix like cosmetic or UI issues is mm -hmm. a big patch. So mm. yeah, I mean, even I if it sounds small, is still a big it off. Some of the biggest pat like okay, so you remember six point eight three, the original six point eight three when they mm -hmm. introduced the rubber band. Yeah. They 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 released I think A, B, and C, and I think it was C was the one that actually fixed the rubber band and got it to a place where it wasn't mm -hmm. like <laughs> there were games that I would cast where like I I remember like it wasn't newbie it was like old old boys or it wasn't old boys mm -hmm. it was like the other old boys team there's like two retired better teams they were down like 20k gold they lose a team fight specter buys back gets three kills they get like 10k gold like that and then the yeah. patch that fixed it literally just tweaks some numeric value so mm -hmm. I think even if it sounds small, it's always big. The more time, the better. I mean, if like if there's a patch and the only thing that happens is like Flesh, Storm, you know, like the top five heroes become way less viable, then that's just, already going to be a huge patch. Even yeah. if they just literally like nerf the jungle by any measurable amount, that's a gigantic change. Yeah. It, um, three comments. First, the um, one thing regarding the rubber band. They really scaled back the gold metric, but experience is still is ridiculous. Yeah. It is insane. Like, you you will lose a fifteen thousand experience advantage in one team fight. And while the buyback change did affect the gold return, as you get a sixty percent um, decrease, like experience is still full, and that is like the craziest thing. You'll see, you'll trade like two for three, but your support will suddenly go from like level five to level eight. And I really hope they look at that because the game is still in the same place where. It doesn't matter how far ahead you are, you need to play conservatively because you can still very easily lose by just failing in one fight. Um, regarding patching, the reason I don't like the way it's being rolled out is because all of the tournaments that will determine whether or not you get invited to the major will happen on this patch. And, the, and then if you want to qualify to the major, it'll happen on the next patch. I don't think that's a fair way to evaluate teams because you don't know who's going to be good or not 
because you're inviting all of these teams that earned it without actually playing the same game of Dota. Because truthfully, patch to patch, it is not the same game of Dota whatsoever. Um, well, some, some teams, some players are just better at different things. Some teams are better at five manning. Some teams are better at aggression. Some teams are better at playing the slow split push game. Like every player and every team has their strengths. So I 100% I agree that like as much as yes, there are constants and certain players just have purely better mechanics, better decision making, better map awareness. There are areas where equally good players have different strengths and weaknesses. And while you may be the best at 6.83, that doesn't mean you're going to be the best team at 6.84. Even if you control for practice, even if you control for the same players, things can still vary. So I, I definitely agree. At the same time, though, from a Valve point of view, it's like, obviously, they're always going to be patching the game. They're always going to be introducing mm -hmm. new heroes, maybe very slowly, but they are. And the problem for Valve is with the majors, they don't have nine months off where it's TI and everything else. Now, it's TI and it's three majors. So, like, is there ever really a good time? I guess ideally, maybe you do, like you have the patch ready to drop after right, the major, after but after but in order but in order to do that, like you're just creating a patch that isn't based on community reaction feedback, your own evaluation of the gameplay at the major. And then if you want to wait for go. the major, then you're kind of in this situation. But I think they'll be a lot quicker once reborn is sorted. Like reborn is kind of the the I'm sure that elephant most, in the room, yeah, right? Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah. I'm sure like there's all these game breaking bugs, and I'm sure they're just sitting there like trying to fix all those first. Although I'm sure that it's different, I'm sure it's different people who do balance and stuff like that. So, do you guys have any other thoughts on on patch timing, or is it just a issue of Valve's at a point where they don't have a lot of other options? Because, yeah, like you yeah. said, like, I mean, no, no, no. I this think is, this is like definitely slowly right. become a problem in every game. It's like hmm. you know, when we started, it was like, well, actually, it, it kind of has always been like this, where Valve has kind of just deployed patches in the middle of events. Like they've definitely deployed decent sized patches, like right in the middle of lands, like no fucks given, and. Yeah. Sometimes it happens. Not a lot, but that has happened. And so, to, I mean, I think they just kind of have to, right? It's like you wait for everything to be gone, then it's never going to happen. To go off of what LD's saying, like when there was TI, it was different because you earned your invite during the right. year. Then there's a big patch, then there's qualifiers, then there's TI. It makes sense. But with majors, it's different. And really, like the big flaw I see with it is just that you're evaluating and inviting teams based on a game that is going to be changing drastically. And it, it's, I definitely I just see your point on that. Fair, mm -hmm. because you're earning your invite. Like it's seriously a different game. Like 6.83 and 6.84. A big part of the reason we even made it to TI was because of the patch. I was a terrible drafter and player in 6.83. It was not my style at all. Games were going 45 plus minutes. Pressure lineups were like tempo control was dead, and you were just picking cores and farming and trying not to throw. Mm -hmm. well, look, at, like, look at Vici Gaming at TI, where like they happen to sort of figure out what works for them in the lower bracket because they just have so much individual talent. But that team was not comfortable, and the, they were never comfortable on the patch, even going as far mm -hmm. as they did. Like I would say that team was never comfortable at TI, as good as they are as individual players. And yeah, maybe they had some internal issues, but the biggest issue for them was the patch. Like they just they never adjusted to the patch or had a, a style that worked on it. So yeah, I mean. I think it will get better when Reborn is sorted, though, because I think at that point, like, is it really that, especially if it's numerical tweaks, Valve can do that a lot quicker. Like, the reason why we're not seeing the patch yet is because there's so many other bugs. They don't want to release mm. the big new balance patch and have all the discussion of it be completely undermined by, oh, I can't watch in Dota TV, or I can watch mm. for free, or I bought the ticket and it doesn't show up, or my hat doesn't work, or more game-breaking shit, like I can I randomly click and it doesn't do anything in Reborn, or, oh, oh this ward sees something it's not supposed to. How, like, how about yeah. you can't download any replays on, like, there's no page two of recent games. Oh, by so the way, before, the player, I can't gonna download real, past real quick, replays. Yeah. You, you can. So the, it, just wow. if you have a computer that doesn't hasn't patched, you can copy the directory, into Jesus. a separate directory and then open dota2.exe and then you can download the replays apparently but it's wow. not that's an app, but it's, the, the, the solution shouldn't be that difficult not don't get me wrong i'm not saying this is acceptable but just so you know as a player there is a very roundabout Dude, way to how about the fact that there's no fucking okay t time out we're gonna talk there's about no we're, I, I i hold on i put time aside for us to focus on reborn so before we transition to that because it's next i want to ask you this regarding patches do you think the patch schedule is in any way a symptom of Valve still viewing this as just a game that we create, maintain, and make money off of, whereas everybody else and players and staff and studios are trying to see it as a way that we earn our living? Or do you think that Valve truly oh. understands and appreciates that aspect? That it's, it's not just, just a, a it's game. Just how the it's just because of the way the company works. It's like, you know, there's... 
it's it's hard to explain but basically if you think about it this way a lot of the things in my opinion at least a lot of the things that happen in dota are like probably a result of an individual's decision mm -hmm. at valve and as a result like i don't think i, I don't think they're I think, I mean, it's just how the company works. It's a symptom of how the company works and how they Yeah, it's really, you kind of, you have to be, like, after... For better or worse, like, obviously it works for them. After going to the TF5, like, TF5 is the only LAN event I've been to, and you actually, you understand a lot more how it works. It's just really, like, everyone, they're, re they're super passionate about the game. Like, I, um, after a game we played against Fnatic, like, Eric Johnson himself came up to me and was like, what item are you going to go next on Venomancer? And I had him guess, and he knew what it was. Like, they, they know the competitive scene. They get Dota. Like, they give a shit about it. And I think that the main focus regarding the pruning of this game is something that no other real developer does because they, they are balancing the game for the competitive scene, for making it marketable as an eSport. And that really does take time. And there's a whole bunch of other shit going on. And as Gerg has said, there's no, there's no eSports manager guy. Like, everybody just does stuff. And then when it's ready, it's ready, and they... Yeah, exactly. And they just it's, ship still, it. it's still not their business though, right? Like it's not, their business is not esports. Sure, it's a part of what they do as a company and it helps fuel the game's growth. And obviously they make money off of it, but it's not their core business and it never will be. Yeah, or at least I don't, I don't see it ever being their core business. To me, like, mm -hmm. look at it like versus like the NFL. Like when the NFL introduces a rule change, like one of the big ones that comes to mind is wide receivers used to get a lot more pressure at the line of scrimmage. Like you could really mm -hmm. fuck them up as a cornerback and now they have the five yard rule where once you get past five yards yeah. you can't be handsy or you're going to get a flag thrown like you will get penalized for that in fact almost to a fault where now there's a new movement in football fans well it's not new but it's been around for like 10 years now five ten years of like what the fuck guys you know like you literally can't even touch a receiver they're like god's gift to the game same with it's quarterbacks like even more kickers so kickers too dude kicker <laughs> kickers uh, kind of a special i have shitty now let's let's not get too distracted by that, but <laughs> no we're, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there and i want to say i did i was gonna give you a point for bringing up the uh, no touch after five yard rule because i think that that's incredibly lame but then i took away a point because you don't understand that 10 years is not a short amount of time uh, in the grand Fuck scheme off, of coffee. No, no, can I, can, I just finish, can I just finish my point? Yeah, you can finish your point. I'll let you finish Okay, so, point. so no. to conclude my point, like, when the NFL changes a rule, it directly and essentially impacts their bottom line because their business is the sport. Do Valve's business right. is not the sport of competitive Dota. Dota, as a game, is their business, and there is a difference. So that's where I think, like, they're just never going to have the same level of focus to the impact on the scene because it's not as essentially tied to their business. It's just... They, they do care. They will try, but it's, there's always going to be a bit of a gap. I think that's a strong point, but I'm not going to award it to you because it was done after the buzzer. So that's let's fine. move on to the next topic. Okay, brother. <laughs> the next topic, let's talk about Reborn. You guys already brought it up a little bit. Everything from uh, professional effects or tournament effects like no lobby remakes, which seems a little bit crazy to me, the constant disconnects, the delays, and then to the other side of like the casual game where a large portion of the success of the pro scene is due to having fans, people who support it. Now, a lot of casuals have been telling me I'm not playing because queue times are insane, because there's a disconnect in every single game. Um, is it? Ha we talked about this a little bit last week, but I want to know, have we gotten to a point where we can be genuinely angry that this stuff isn't fixed yet? And how do you release a patch with overlooking things like lobby reloads, not remakes, I'm sorry, or uh, game remakes if something shuts down? Customers I, can always be angry. Yeah. I just want to start. Customers can always. I be used to work in retail, Toffees. Let me tell you about angry customers <laughs> at an Apple store, so you can imagine. Yeah, I think uh -huh. customers are always allowed to be angry. I, I don't know from a software developer point of view because I'm not a software developer. None, none of us are, as far as I'm aware. So I don't think anyone here is qualified to evaluate Valve and say like, oh, like if you know, at our company we could have done this better or. You know, having been in that situation, releasing this huge patch or architecture mm -hmm. change, like this is what you could do differently. I, I get the sense that things are not going as smoothly as they expected. Mm. Uh, I, I just, <laughs> the fact that they're not fixing issues, like in Source 1, when they would fix issues, issues would get fixed like very quickly, especially towards the end of Source 1's lifetime in Dota 2. So I get the sense there's some like underlying like core issues in the, like in mm. the, the new architecture. I'm purely speculating. I could be totally wrong, but I just feel like there's something like fundamental, like there's some fundamental bugs. wrong with the whole thing. Yeah. And like they're, they're, they're busy trying to fix that and like they're kind of patching some of the other stuff, but like they know there's something bigger that once they fix it, like a lot of other stuff will be resolved. So hmm. 
that's just my that's my read as a non-developer from the outside because i mean their track record is if there's not a big issue they'll fix a lot quicker so i i personally think there's something else going on and they're they're very busy uh, working on that and we just can't i, I think it. i wish that okay I, i'll i think i wish that there was still a way that we could use source one for tournaments but mm. that kind of like custom support is just not really a thing that you can reasonably expect out of it. That's like something Riot would do, but... No, no, the problem is, like, you have to move everything to Reborn so that everyone's playing it. Like, this is going to be the game that they use at the Major. So they need yeah, as well. much testing. It needs to be as thoroughly examined as possible. Yeah. And one of the big ways you really get into weird mechanics is you pro players. Yeah, use the game in a competitive setting. Games. I'm, I'm pretty happy the map starts exploding at, like, 90 minutes again. That's a big yeah. upgrade for me. Can, I missed that. Um, how is I, that bug not fixed? I, I, I play a fuck ton of Dota and I scrim all the time and I've been playing matches, etc. I've had over the past three days, I've had two disconnects in separate games where there was no remake. It was just you're playing four versus five. Like deal with it. And, and what do you I, do as an organizer at that right. point? Like, it's you such that's, that's, that's my biggest there's problem. no reload functionality. Yeah, it's like I wish there was some way that tournaments could use it. Only if that like that's for me is the biggest thing. If you if the game DCs, then like the, that's the, worst, the so lag fun. is terrible in some servers like you just get a bad server and then it just lags like well, and, 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 and then 15 seconds later you're like finally paused and nothing's happened it's and just... to your point swindles about like well this is because you brought up really like oh you know the patch that you qualify for these events on you mm -hmm. know esl mlg whatever is not the patch you're going to play the major at the other issue is like if you don't get to the major like let's say you guys get to the major and you would have done amazingly well if you don't get or if you don't get to oh sorry not the major like eso one or one of the big events before the major you don't get to prove what you can do and that was not going to see it so you have to go through the open qualifiers you you miss out on that more guaranteed opportunity to get there which maybe a team could have could have earned so it's like yeah it's just a random online match it's not it's not you know it's not the major qualifiers but mm. everything is kind of a major everything qualifier matters. right everything's a major qualifier that's how i look at it right yeah, now yeah we need to take like bts americas could have an incredible like whether or not i i we'll get to this topic later about na versus eu but i'm really hoping a second na team gets invited to the major and bts americas could be like the deciding tournament and it's just some well, i mean in the in the past like random online had, uh, there's always been some smaller tournaments that have helped like guide the competitive scene in terms of like the teams that you see in these mm -hmm. qualifiers yeah like canada yeah. cup comes yeah, to canada mind cup for in america, america. If you look at canada cup and you look at the american qualifiers it is like it's just the same like yeah. the same teams and that's sort of been the case you know canada cup has helped found a lot of teams from the bts for like the summit americas and all that stuff i mean i definitely think that you know you can't discount these smaller tournaments even you know even the medium size or bigger ones i just think it's pretty unacceptable for like for something as bad as no relive not being that like blows and me. and the worst to me is the the team that the thing that scares me the most would be a team specifically from our region getting invited to ti or the major rather and underperforming because they're not as good on the that patch as they are the previous one and they look really bad but yeah, and then everyone you, says NA Dota yeah. sucks ass. You yeah. know, America, but, fuck America, Dota is terrible. Eagles. And NA if the Dota, other American yeah. team was there, they would have done better, possibly. So. Yeah, but and not only that, but NA Dota, there's so many new players. Like, one of the big advantages I had when I was finally good at Han was that I, I was in my fourth year of the game. So when the patch changed, you know, I knew the differences in how you have to play the game if you're running a jungler and the other team is, or if they're aggressive tri laning, or if they're 2 one twoing, or if they have two mid. And that's why players like Puppy are always going to be successful, because they've been playing the game for so long that they understand it far better than anyone else. They benefit from a rapid patch much better than, say, you know, SVG or myself would, because of how long they've been playing the game. Hmm. So this patch drastically changes our understanding of Dota, and we have to learn everything from scratch. Puppy's just like, oh shit, this is just like like 5.3 back in 2009 or whatever the fuck. And yeah, pushing is <laughs> gonna be a lot stronger now. Or this is where you can like use jungle heroes or yeah. you know like aggressive warding. You can get away with it better now. Or mm -hmm. this is like the patch where I mean, you know, TI didn't work out. Like you can pull a bottle to your carry at level one, and it's mm -hmm. gonna be strong in this patch. But yep. yeah, I mean, you just don't know when you, when there's no time to really study the game. And and the worst is that in between. There will just not be enough tournaments. All the big tournaments are going to happen before the majors or after the invites have gone out. There'll be major qualifiers. There'll be a couple lands that maybe the team that qualifies isn't actually going to because they qualified for those in the previous patch. And then they show up to the major with nothing but scrims to prepare them for the best teams in the world. And 
I just, it's just, I just don't think that's fair. <laughs> so well, it's never going to be fair. Like, never, that's the reality yeah, of competition. Yeah. Life's it's never not gonna be perfect. Fair. Life's not fair, yeah. yeah. Life's, not, Life's fair. not fair, Swindle. And no. I'm sure when you guys Sometimes get ready to play, you realize like, yeah, we're getting like there might be fuck us over, we're gonna do our best anyway. But it still sucks, like if you if you feel you could have done better. So to stay on topic about reborn and sort of the buggy rollout of this thing, Swindle, I feel like you've done a good job of <laughs> instead of taking your soapbox, just sort of sliding into four different topics, being like, listen <laughs> though, this is an issue. And I, I respect well, that. That was that was aggressive. But reborn rollout bugs, situations like this, what can Valve do to sort of, I don't want somebody to fix it, but appease the community? And in any other situation, and we talked about this last week, the SimCity rollout that was debacle of the year, right? It was a complete travesty. Fraxis eventually fixed it, and they gave away a bunch of free games to try and make it up to those who had purchased. Is there anything that Valve can do to sort of say to the community, hey, oh, this happened too early? Or do they, not, no, should they have to? Do that because for, okay, you have to imagine like, everyone that works at Valve is a developer. The best way for them to QA their software is to get fucking however many million people playing it mm. over the course of a week. And clearly it's working because every other thread on Reddit is a bug thread. I mean, it's just... I mean, I understand why they did it, but... It's, so you're saying know. it's a business decision yeah. more than anything else? No, it's not just, like, a revenue. It's just... It's way easier if you have a million beta testers rather than, like, you know, however many they have in the office. <laughs> And a fair point, I will say chat just pointed out, it is a free-to-play game. So at the end of the day, like, you know, we're playing for free. Well, is it free-to-play when you've dropped, like, $10,000 on hats that you can't use because they don't show up in the game? I don't know. That's that's you're very like, debatable. LT, you're like the degenerate gambler at the black <laughs> table asking for credit because you've just <laughs> lost so much money, you deserve another shot. You really want those points, don't you? Or at least yeah. the buffet. You know, uh, but that's good. We'll wrap up that topic so we have time to get to a last one. And now there were two options here, but I think I'm going to go to, I'm going to save North America versus European biases within the scene for next time. But I do want to talk about North America. Swindle brought this up a little bit, and this is what I want to talk about. Fire just won ESL New York qualifiers. They got a spot over C9, uh, Digital Chaos, and <laughs> Complexity Gaming. Uh, it was a tough road to get there. They had a very difficult bracket. Does this, A, cement them as a real potential North American powerhouse? And what I really want to know is how competitive is the next year looking in terms of getting that second and third North American spot for tournaments? Because generally, when it gets to the big show at the land, we get maybe two, if we're lucky, three spots for North American teams. Uh, in the past, it wasn't nearly as competitive. Do you think this is going to be a really competitive year? I think beyond fire, you have to look at the NA scene right now and... I mean, the way that I look at it is, you know, EG, assume, assuming they're still playing well, is sort of a tier above the rest, uh, which I think is still true. But you have all of these teams now that are, like, extremely close in skill level. If you, mm. I mean, obviously, I know, like, a lot of scrim results and stuff like that. So, I, like, they're very, I think a lot of these teams are very similar. When you look at uh, HCWP, who have had really bad public results, uh, but since switching the roster, it's been a lot better. Um the Fire obviously has played extremely well. Cloud9, Dumpster, DC. Then DC, Dumpster, Cloud9. Uh, complexity. You guys, have you guys, uh, you're kind of in the HCWP, but you've kind of gotten wrecked on a lot of these tournaments. What are you talking We've played in one tournament and we lost in the Dumpster. Time. He loves okay, State That's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I was so excited to get okay, to well, that I mean, my how many point lost, is, like, how many, you guys are changing your roster? Like, did you just give yeah. up hope on the previous iteration? Do At you least you've kept our to shit player? together, Bird. Come on. No, Claire, Claire left. Blah, blah, blah. I'm not oh, he left. Oh, he I, left. He, All right, both of your teams I was suck playing ass. In the Shut game. the fuck up. <laughs> anyway, Nobody cares. So I think when you look at C9, DC, and Fire, right now, those teams are all extremely close. I think Complexity and HCWP, from what I've heard from scrims, are also extremely close with those three teams. And I think the most interesting thing is uh, when you look at DC, like, most people expected them to be just automatically like the second best team or whatever in North America. And that is certainly not, at least for now, been the case. So I actually have a question. Okay, well, I just want to interject. I, say, somebody I, asked Kurt, like, how good do you think your team's going to be in a fucking interview? And he says, I think we'll be top two in NA, which is not even that aggressive of a statement. He was asked the question. Mm -hmm. So let's not go around saying they're like, oh, yeah, we're definitely the second best team in America. You know, fuck everybody else. They're all shit. We're mm -hmm. way better than like that's that's just that's just Reddit circle jerk bullshit, right. man. Come on. Yeah, I mean, but obviously, I mean, 
I've talked to a lot of people who thought that DC was going to be the second best team. I, I agree. Some of them and, still do. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's okay. But like, let's not pin it on them that well, they're going around talking about shit. Maybe they no, are. No, I'm not pinning on them. I'm just okay. saying I think it's I interesting. When Sumail's playing that all on the Wars account, they are without a doubt number two in NA. <laughs> what did you say? When, when Sumail's on your Wars account. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, that, I feel like that was a quality shot there. Um, but here's my... Here, okay, first off, Greg, you did want to postulate a question. I want to give you a chance to ask that question that you were looking to ask. before. I, we... I was just curious if you guys had any strong opinions about why DC has not been playing as well as people expected. Oh, can I can I soapbox this? Because I've been scrimming NA, NA teams for like three weeks yeah, now. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, um, oh, go ahead. We're gonna oh, get a second seconds. soapbox now. Yeah. So get, I'm at LD. <laughs> this is my soapbox. Please. <laughs> Take a seat for a second. Um, first, the big difference is TI3 to TI4. You have like a pretty big tournament, a couple million dollars. Suddenly TI4 is like 10 and a half. Now TI5 is 17.5. So it's not necessarily about, oh, this team's like DC is here and C9's here. It's that we're all doing this as our career, as our job, because there is so much money on the line. The scene is so stable that we know there's going to be 15 to 20 major land tournaments. Valve's now throwing majors in addition to TI, and it is a pretty conservative estimate that there'll be, what, $25 million, $30 million in this, scene, uh, this season from TI to TI? It's a fuck ton of money. So whereas previously, like in, in America, it's far less accepted to be a young adult living with your parents. In Europe and Asia, it's far more culturally acceptable to just live at home. It's what you're supposed to do. Um, that's just how things work. In America, we... Damn it. That's your soapbox. <laughs> bring, oh, well. bring everybody else back online. Anyway, point, we're trying harder now. It's not as simple as, oh, well, these guys are better. Like, Dota's really fucking hard. A lot of it has to do with draft and strategy and preparation. Mm -hmm. So, some one day, like, we'll 3-0 DC. Then the next day, they'll 2-0 us. Nothing's changed except for the strategies and the discussions they had after the games. There's definitely an element of any given Sunday right now, right. In, a, in a lot of scenes as well. Even in, in SEA before TI, everyone's like, oh, yeah, you know, Fnatic's way better than all these other teams. Like, Fnatic lost, like, so many matches going into TI against other SEA teams. Yeah, they get invited. Yeah, they probably would have done better than most of the other SEA teams. I'm excluding the Korean teams for this discussion. But it, it was still an any given Sunday situation there. And I think it's becoming more of one in America, barring the... The elephant in the room, EG. Right. Good luck beating them, but uh, at least in the near future. Yeah. But I, I, I think in general, like we're gonna continue to see what we saw at the past TI. It's been a growing trend. Favorite teams, superstar teams, DK, Secret. These teams are not actually unbeatable. It just takes the right strategy, the right leadership, and good decision making to to win a match off of them. And you, suddenly you win one game off of them at TI or a major. They're in the lower bracket, or they don't make the cut to be in the winner bracket if it's the group stage. So. Mm. It just it just takes that one good match and then things change. And you you can tell just if you go back through like old like just go Dota buff from team to team and look at the heroes that are banned against certain teams like C deck would pick heroes that E home wouldn't touch and vice versa, and that's what makes this game so complicated because it's not about even being the best team. It's about understanding your opposition and being the best team against them on that day. Mm. And I think that's part of the reason EG did so well is because they prepared better than every other team at the event, and they had defined plans going into each match, which is why they could, you know, lose to C deck and then look better. They, and if you look at, if you watch, go back and watch the games, like I've watched the upper bracket finals and then the actual finals, and EG looks like a different team. Yeah. And C deck, at the, the yeah. winter bracket finals, they're shitting on them. They're like, they know how yeah, to play yeah. Dota. And then finals, they look lost. And it's all about preparation and the strategy that goes. And if you play that, if you play that match, and then C deck has like a week to adjust or something, mm -hmm. who knows what the like how what their adjustments sure. are? Maybe they throw a curveball at EG, and it's a different series. So, yeah, it, it's so much of it is just yeah. based on preparation and chances to to react to teams. We play. we we used to, we said this at TI, just like getting hyped. Like it's not about being the best team, fifty one out of a hundred. It's about being the best two out of three, and that that really can go any different way. Okay, let me let me side side move us on this topic and let me ask this. We've talked about North American teams. You guys listed a lot of teams in that sort of discussion of next up behind EG, which is an interesting to, well, which will make an interesting year to watch sort of as everybody qualifies for majors. Do you think that majors and the 
A, lack of information, and B, closeness of them is going to be enough to hold these teams together aggressively, or do you think that it's going to be the same old North American story? Depends on the teams. I don't know. I think a lot of that comes down to individual personalities. It's just too speculative. We don't know who's going to be there. We don't know who they're played against. We don't know what the patch is going to look like. I'd, I'd be very surprised if most of these teams did not make some sort of adjustment after the first major, though. Because there is another period. No, it's not even after the first them. major. It's after the qualifier. If you don't qualify, like you're right. just, you can well, change yeah, your roster obviously. freely. Yeah, if you well, don't qualify. It's yeah, like I mean, mid-October. Teams are going to start. Like yeah. all the non-major teams are going to Yeah, shuffle. if you don't, if, well, yeah, if you don't qualify, then, then you can shuffle. Yeah, we're going to probably have to make the major, and then we probably won't do so well, so we'll have to cut way two to make that jump from tier three to tier two. <laughs> Yeah, brutal, brutal. Uh, okay, so let me ask you this then. You mentioned that there will be there, there'll be likely small changes, and I think that every sports team in Some every sport in the world. Well, even even if here's my question: How much does a team change before we start to consider them not staying together anymore? I mean, if you make a trade up and you drop one player and pick up another, would we cut consider that a large team change in the sense of this team's not staying together, or is Why that is something that? that I'm just curious because that's the conversation you always see is like NA Dota can't stick to a roster. But if you change one player, does that count as really honestly changing a roster that much? Huh? This question is stupid. All right. Can you minus your own points. I agree. No, but I'm going to take a point off of you because you can't. Call I mean, me who, stupid. I, who, all right. I also would like to take question. off. I want Toffees to take off two points. <laughs> <laughs> For I mean, myself, like, I will happily. I'm at negative four I mean, it's right basically now. Basically, just. I give Greg his point back. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> he needs it, dude. Basically, I mean, three out of five, and it's a new team. I don't fucking know what kind of question is that. Well, I, I, that's what I'm saying, though. I think let me like rephrase. In contract with sponsors, or like no, traditionally, and this is, and I've only been in this scene specifically Dota for about two years now, and all I've ever heard is North American teams cannot last. They constantly change. They do not stay together. <laughs> Oh, yeah, are we I really not know. doing EU and AVI? Like, does EU really stay together? Yeah, Look at Alliance. Yeah. Holy, is there any team in Europe other than VP that's the same roster? VP and Golden Boys, that's it. Okay. Is anything the same? It, no. Yeah, no one, I think that ch probably the Chinese scene is the most stable because they have these exorbitant They're not even stable. They roster. have one team that didn't change roster, and it's the second place team at TI. BG Gaming changed their carry. No, that's no, a I mean, fucking no, no. For the Chinese teams, I mean, like after, t like, after that initial shuffle, they seem to change a lot less because their contracts... Are actually executed. Okay, no, 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 the big difference in China is that the the orgs are much more stable. Yeah. Because the the groups that have the money to attract exactly. top players are very limited because there's way more money in the scene. The big difference in China is the organizations, not mm. the not like the team compositions changing. But I mean, you could make the argument that you know if if all the organizations have equal money, then it becomes more about which is the best team. And that's just not the case in America right now, where there aren't really that many orgs that are giving players a great salary, great benefits, mm. great support, an excellent manager. Like, there's a couple, but orgs matter a lot more in the Western scene. And specifically, I would say, in North America and Southeast Asia, I say Western meaning outside of China, basically, in this case. Fair enough. All right, so that will be the wrap-up on that topic. Uh, apparently, I screwed the pooch at the back end, so my sincerest apologies for ending there because this is the time for the show, though I am curious about it. I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see how changes happen after majors. Let's go to the scoreboard and see where we're sitting right now. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow, did he pull Balls. ahead at the last possible second? That's uh, that's unfortunate. I thought. I think you're, I think you're biased. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what? I thought the Chinese stability thing was a good point, so I, I gave I gave one gave one for that. That's I'll take. I mean, I'll take the win. You know. <laughs> so, uh, Greg comes in at third at twenty one. Went on a good roll there for a minute. I thought you were gonna get. I thought you were gonna pull farther out there, Greg. But I don't I, come on the show to win. Yeah. I come to, to speak my mind. Okay. I appreciate that. That's yeah. what we love about Age -based you. Age-based affirmative action. Swindle was robbed. Swindle, <laughs> according to chat. Swindle was to... robbed at 25. Uh, I think it was ro oh, he, the real robbing was that the, the, sh the your internet stopped working last week. I'm pretty sure that he is true. Won that he was he was doing very well last week. So uh, uh, though Swindle has told me he'd love to come back, and we're going to have him back for sure because uh, I like people who are passionate about topics. 
Uh, so second place, 25. Appreciate you being here. And the big winner tonight comes back again. Defenses Championship. Can he be stopped is the real question. It wins the Aegis for a return whenever he feels like getting it is LD. Uh, David, because you won, you get yourself a little bit of time to talk about anything you want to talk about. Uh, so we will put some time on the clock and give you a chance to speak your mind. Yeah, okay, so I, this one's for Charlie. If you're not going to come on the fucking show, then just shut the fuck up in chat. Nobody cares about what you have to say in chat. That's it. Charlie, come on the show or be quiet. <laughs> All right. Wait, <laughs> people <laughs> care what Charlie has to say? <laughs> So the closing argument, the closing discussion is a shot at Charlie, which I think it might have been on episode one, too. That makes me Fuck smile Charlie. because continuity. Continuity, boys and girls. Thank you to my guests for being here tonight. You can find David Gorman at LD Dota. You can find Kyle Friedman at Swindles with two Zs. You can find Greg Laird at What is Hit TV. You can find me at Toffees underscore Dota 2. Thank you to Razor for having us on. This has been a new episode of Around the Pit. We'll be back next Sunday with a brand new episode and some coffee with Toffees coming at you throughout the week. So I hope you had fun as much as I did. Gentlemen, it's been wonderful having you here. And as always, Toffees out.